Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Uh, Steve Hahn, and Steve is a professor of medicine and surgery and one of our bright hepatologists at UCLA, and his topic is going to be hepatitis B, uh, treatment and consequences. Steve? Thank you. I'd like to thank the course organizers for inviting me to come speak. I'm going to, uh, in the next 20 minutes, bring you up to date on hepatitis B, uh, which has really seen a, a, a huge uh, revolution in treatment and diagnosis over the last decade. So as you can see here, um, hepatitis B is a huge worldwide problem. It causes a lot of morbidity and mortality. Um, but most importantly, you can see that most uh, hepatitis B carriers are Asian. Three quarters of all hepatitis B in the world is, uh, are in Asian patients. So if you look at the worldwide distribution, it looks like this. Uh, the countries in red are high prevalence. The U.S. overall is still considered low prevalence for hepatitis B, except for areas like this, where we have a high population of Asian patients. So how is it that Asian patients uh, were afflicted with this problem? It all goes back to how the virus was acquired. And you can see here that in the West, uh, hepatitis B is usually acquired parenterally or from sexual contact. Whereas in Asia, hepatitis B is acquired vertically uh, from mother to baby, uh, usually perinatally. So the big difference is the age at which the hepatitis was acquired. In the West, it was acquired as uh, young adults. In the East, it's acquired uh, as infants. And you can see in infants where the immune response is weak, the chronicity, if they should acquire hepatitis B, is quite high compared to young adults. So that's why hepatitis B has been perpetuated in Asian patients. It's passed on vertically, and the chronicity rate is very high. So those are the at-risk patients, the young infants, and that's why now the standard of care for hepatitis B prevention is a routine vaccination of all infants at birth, uh, and we should be very vigilant about vaccinating all at-risk populations, including young children, and actually all of us being medical caregivers should all have been vaccinated also. So now a little bit about the virology of hepatitis B. It's a small virus. It replicates very efficiently, but it is error prone. And what that translates into clinically are mutants. So hepatitis B is plagued with a problem with mutants. And one of the most common mutants is the so-called E antigen negative pre-core basal core promoter mutant. And the most important thing to remember is that this E antigen negative mutant is usually seen in older patients and it is more aggressive than the wild type. We see more fibrosis with this uh, mutant and it's also more difficult to treat. So the issue with hepatitis B is we have this condition that most patients acquire at birth. They've had the virus for 30 to 50 years of infection and somewhere along the way, this virus can cause disease. It can cause cirrhosis. It can cause liver cancer. Now, the interesting and probably the most difficult thing about hepatitis B is it's not a stagnant virus. It's very dynamic. The virus goes through various phases, from an immune tolerant phase to chronic active hepatitis to inactive carrier, and it's fluid. A patient can go through these phases many times in their lifetime the end result is that the patient get, can at some point develop cirrhosis. Likewise, a patient at some point can develop cancer. And the problem with hepatitis B, which is unique, is that a patient with hepatitis B can develop cancer even in the absence of cirrhosis. So in the hepatology world, uh, our mission was to try to figure out how can we predict which patients are going to go from inactive infection to disease? What blood tests should we be looking for? Now, the issue is we didn't know for many, many years. 
But recently, in 2006, this study came out, and it's called the REVEAL study, and it was a huge study that was done in Taiwan. They followed a number of patients for 15 years untreated, and at the end of 15 years, they knew who developed cirrhosis, they knew who developed cancer, and when they went back to look at all the predictive uh, variables, everything fell out except for one thing, and that was the baseline viral load. So you can see here that if the viral load is less than 10 to the fourth copies per ml, the chance of developing cancer over time is much lower, but if the viral load is higher than 10 to the fourth copies per ml, the, uh, the, the risk of cancer increases. And when they looked at cirrhosis, the curves were almost the same. 10 to the fourth copies uh, is the so-called uh, threshold value. That, that translates to 2,000 international units per ml. So this study was the first big study that came out telling us the importance of the viral load in hepatitis B. With that revelation came the revolution. Uh, hepatitis B treatment took off after that. And quite frankly, we saw a huge increase in the number of drugs that became available for hepatitis B. So you can see now we have seven FDA-approved drugs for hepatitis B. Five are oral on top, two on the bottom are the interferons. And if you look at the date that these drugs were approved, you can see that most of the good drugs were approved uh, subsequently after that REVEAL study came out. So 2005 and beyond was when most of our new drugs came out. So the knowledge and the treatment that we have for hepatitis B has really uh, improved dramatically, but this has been a, a very recent development. So clearly, because the viral load is important in disease progression, treatment is aimed at suppressing the viral load. And if you can do that, then you can hopefully suppress the cirrhosis and the liver cancer. So who are the patients that are gonna need hepatitis B treatment? In order to decide, you first have to decide, are they E-antigen positive, E-antigen negative? Do they have cirrhosis? Once you stratify them into one of those groups, then the two blood tests that you look at to decide treatment are the viral load and the ALT level. Now, all the different societies have had all their recommendations. They're summarized here. But in general, you can see you have to decide, are you dealing with E-antigen positive wild type, E-antigen negative mutant? Once you decide that, you're looking at the viral load and the ALT level to decide treatment. And for the most part, you can see that for E-antigen positive patients, they're using 20,000 international units as the cutoff. And for E-antigen negative patients, they're using 2,000. So the 2,000 international units is what translates to the 10,000 copies per ml that the REVEAL study had pointed out to us. So this is kind of a little bit difficult to, 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 uh, to look at. Uh, and living in Los Angeles, you know, we're all used to driving, we're all used to stoplights, and so I always like to, to point it out this way. In an E-antigen positive patient, who should you treat? Well, if the viral load is less than 20,000, that's considered a red light. If the ALT is normal, that's considered another red light. Two red lights, this is a patient that you can monitor without treatment. But if the patient has a viral load above 20,000, that's a green light. And if the ALT is elevated, that's another green light. Two green lights, and that's the patient you should consider for treatment. Now the problem is we always see patients who have a high viral load, which is a green light, but a normal ALT, which is a red light. I call that my yellow light patients. Uh, they're typically called the immune tolerant patients. And what the societal guidelines say to do in these patients is to do a biopsy as a tiebreaker. But who wants to do a biopsy? Patients don't want biopsies. They're invasive. It's difficult to convince them to have it. So Dr. Tong came up with what we call a risk stratification score. And based on some non-invasive, easily obtainable uh, criteria, you can assign points to this patient. And, if the, and these, these criteria are listed here. And if the patient has three or more points, then that's probably a patient you should treat. 
If they have less than three points, that's a patient you can continue to monitor. So that's the algorithm for deciding which E antigen positive patients to treat. E antigen negative, exactly the same, except that the cutoff for the viral load is lower, 2,000. So low viral load, red light. Normal ALT, red light. Two red lights, watch. High viral load, green light. High ALT, two green lights. Two green lights, this is a patient you should consider for treating. If they have a high viral load, but a normal ALT, that's your yellow light patient. And then you can apply Dr. Tong's uh, point stratification system. If they have three points or more, consider for treatment. If they have less than three points, consider just monitoring these patients. If you have a cirrhotic patient, the algorithm is a little bit different. With a cirrhotic patient, if the ALT is elevated, that's an indication for treatment according to the societal guidelines. If the ALT is normal, then you look at the viral load. If the viral load is elevated, you go ahead and treat. But if the ALT is normal and the viral load is low, that's a patient you can just monitor. So you now have your patient, E antigen positive. You've decided they've met the two green light criteria for treatment. You started them on treatment. What are the endpoints? On treatment, the first thing that goes down is the viral load followed by the ALT. Now in E antigen positive patients, we treat until this so-called E zero conversion. And that can be variable. It can take uh, years, it can take months for this to happen. It's, it's variable in each individual patient. But once they E antigen seroconvert, you treat them for six to 12 months of additional therapy, we call that consolidation, and then you can stop. And if you do that, up to 91% of the patients that you treat this way will have a durable response and the virus will stay down. You can see, looking at the comparison of all the medications, uh, the drugs to the right, which are the newer drugs, are much more effective at dropping the viral load. You can see that E antigen seroconversion is variable, but tends to increase with longer treatment duration. And you can see that if you do this, if you follow this algorithm, your durability, maintaining viral suppression, is pretty good across the board for the different medications. What about your E antigen negative patient that you decided to treat? Same thing. They're on drug, the viral load drops, the ALT normalizes. Now the problem with E antigen negative hepatitis B is the relapse rate is very high. Almost 100% of the patients, the viral load comes right back when we stop medication. So now the recommendation is for E antigen negative that they need indefinite treatment or until they're lucky enough to maybe lose surface antigen. But this is a very uncommon event. If they lose surface antigen, you can potentially stop. But otherwise, E antigen negative patients are gonna need indefinite therapy. And again, comparing the different drugs, you can see the newer drugs to the right are much more effective in dropping that viral load. Now, the big problem with the oral medications for hepatitis B is this problem of resistance. Some drugs have very good resistance. Some drugs have very poor resistance. In general, the newer drugs, tenofovir and entecovir, have the lowest resistance. And so now the societal guidelines say that these two drugs are the preferred medications for hepatitis B treatment. If you compare the drugs, you can see on the top, the new drugs, entecovir and tenofovir, probably less than one and a half, 1% resistance over five years, but the older drugs on the bottom, terrible resistance. With each additional year of treatment, resistance can be as high as 80% with lamivudine. So now, if we decide to treat hepatitis B, it should really be only with the preferred drugs, entecovir or tenofovir. So in conclusion, hepatitis B is a chronic worldwide problem. Uh, three quarters of the patients are Asian. 
Um, the importance of the viral load cannot be stressed uh, any stronger uh, ever since that REVEAL study. So if you have hepatitis B patients, we should be monitoring that viral load. And then remember, the indications for treatment rely on the viral load and the ALT, so you're looking for two green lights versus two red lights. And we hope that with long-term suppression of the virus, we can prevent further disease progression. Perhaps in the future, we'll be better at treating patients and actually getting rid of surface antigen, which is considered the holy grail of treatment, uh, but we're not quite there yet. Thank you very much. Thank you.